the FDTD method, Solver Numerics. As mentioned in the introduction, the finite difference time domain FDTD method is used to solve Maxwell's equations in the time domain. The equations are solved numerically on a discrete grid in both space and time. This means that the electric and magnetic fields, E and H respectively, are discrete in space and time. The grid step in space is generally called delta X or delta Y or delta Z, and in time it is called delta T. For convenience of notation, we often drop the delta X and delta T and simply refer to the spatial grid as I or J or K and the time step as N. Furthermore, we often use a subscript and superscript notation for the spatial position and time step respectively. The E fields are solved at time N plus one half, while the H fields are solved at time N. The derivatives in both space and time are handled with finite differences and are second order accurate when the grid is uniform. The electric and magnetic field components are distributed in space over a unit cell called the Yi cell. This staggering of the fields in space is ideal for calculating spatial derivatives of the curl terms at the correct positions in space. At the beginning of the simulation, the E and H fields are typically zero. From here we update E at time n plus one half, which is a function of E at the previous time step, plus a term proportional to the curl of H at time step n. Once we have the E field updated to time n plus one half, we can proceed to update H at time n plus one, which is a function of H at the previous time step, and the curl of E taken at time step n plus one half. In this way, we can leapfrog the update of E, then H, then E, and so on until we choose to stop the simulation. It is important to understand that we do not ever calculate E and H at the same point in time. They are offset by one half time step. In fact, if you record the E field as a function of time with a monitor and plot it, the monitor will interpolate the original FDTD E fields to the same time step as H, so you may never notice this offset. Despite this issue, this leapfrog approach has the advantage of allowing us to obtain second order accuracy in time, which means that the error between the electromagnetic fields calculated by FDTD and the correct solution scales with the time step squared. This means, for example, that if we reduce the time step by a factor of two, our error diminishes by a factor of four. The simulation geometry is discretized into Yi cells, which, as mentioned previously, are the fundamental unit of the FDTD method. As mentioned before, the E and H field components are all located at different positions within the Yi cell. This allows us to calculate spatial derivatives by finite differences at the optimal spatial locations and gives us second order accuracy in space on a uniform mesh. Still, it is important to understand that the E and H components are never known at the same spatial location, which can have consequences for many types of results which we may wish to calculate, such as energy density. By default, monitors that record these fields will automatically interpolate all field components to the corner of the Yi cell so that you can visualize and analyze your results at the same spatial location. However, this interpolation can be disabled, and this is useful for some advanced calculations, such as determining the optical absorption in a metal near a metal dielectric interface. In addition to E and H, we must also discretize the electric permittivity, epsilon. In most regions, this is very straightforward because we can assign a permittivity of either material A or material B. However, it gets much more complicated near interfaces because the interface can pass through a Yi cell at any position and orientation, and, furthermore, each electric field component is in a different spatial location. As a result, we need a different value for the X, Y, and Z components of the permittivity, even if all materials are isotropic. Once we have discretized the permittivity in this manner, there are still challenges. 
First, the position of the interfaces is not well defined within the Yi cell. For example, if we have a Yi cell with a spatial grid of 40 nanometers, and we move an interface by as much as 20 nanometers, we may not see any difference in the FTTD results, because the permittivity discretization could be identical. Second, we do not treat the normal E field components, which are discontinuous, any differently than the tangential ones, which are continuous. Third, we can experience staircasing effects when interfaces are on an angle with respect to the Cartesian axes, which can lead to problems such as unphysical hotspots in plasmonic devices. The conformal mesh technology is a method to deal with these issues by modifying the standard FDTD update near interfaces to use an integral solution to Maxwell's equations. This is equivalent to introducing an effective permittivity that is anisotropic and can provide a much more accurate solution. We will discuss the conformal mesh technology in more detail later. FTTD simulations can be run in 3D or in 2D. It is important to remember that for 2D simulations, the structure is infinite in the Z dimension. In some cases, 2D simulations are an approximation that can be run quickly, but in other cases they can be a fully accurate solution to the problem. For example, simulating line gratings, like the one shown here on the right, illuminated by plane waves, should be done in 2D. Because 2D FTTD simulations make the assumption that the structure is infinite in the Z dimension, we know that the permittivity and fields are the same for all values of Z. This allows us to separate Maxwell's equations into two independent polarization states, often called transverse electric, or TE, with fields EX, EY, and HZ, and transverse magnetic, or TM, with fields EZ, HX, and HY. In FTTD solutions, we try to avoid the terms TE and TM because they can lead to a great deal of confusion. Instead, it is best to look at the blue arrows of sources in the FTTD design environment to see the direction of E-field polarization. In certain cases, such as anisotropic materials with off-diagonal elements, this separation of polarizations is no longer valid. In general, you simply set your desired source polarization and, in 2D, FTTD solutions will run a TE, TM, or combined TE and TM simulation as required. It is important to think about how the memory and simulation time scale with the grid size. If we assume that the spatial grid size is uniform and that delta X is the same as delta Y and delta Z, then the memory requirements for 3D scale like 1 over delta X cubed in 3D and 1 over delta x squared in 2D. This is obviously expected, but what is surprising is that the simulation time increases, like 1 over delta x to the fourth power in 3D and to the third power in 2D. The reason for this, which we will discuss in more detail later, is that you cannot reduce the spatial grid size without also reducing the size of the time step, delta t. This means that there is a big penalty to pay for using a smaller grid step. For example, if you reduce your grid size by a factor of 2, your simulation time will increase by a factor of 16. Also, we often discuss the grid size not in absolute terms, but relative to the wavelength of light. We call the ratio of the wavelength, lambda, to the grid size, delta x, the number of grid points per wavelength, or sometimes just the points per wavelength. This is a key factor that determines the accuracy of the FTTD simulation. As a coarse rule of thumb, you can get initial FTTD results with 6 points per wavelength, and many results such as transmission and reflection will be within 10 or 20 percent of the correct answer. By 10 points per wavelength, many results will be within 1 to 2 percent of the correct result, and it is rare to require more than 20 points per wavelength. I should note that this is a rule of thumb only, and sometimes much smaller meshes are required to resolve geometric features or to correctly simulate plasmonic effects where high light confinement can occur. It is also important to note that the points per wavelength should be defined with respect to the wavelength in the medium and not the free space wavelength. Therefore, for similar accuracy, a smaller grid size should be used in materials with higher refractive index. 
Lumerical's FTTD Solutions provides a simple mesh accuracy setting that targets a minimum points per wavelength in all regions of the simulation and automatically adapts to the refractive index of the different materials. The mesh accuracy of 1 through 8 corresponds to points per wavelength targets of 6, 10, 14, 18, and so on up to 34. The default value is 2, and this is appropriate for most simulations. Initially, you may want to even use a setting of 1 until everything else is set up properly. It is rarely useful to use values of larger than 3 or 4, as there is typically something else that limits the accuracy of the simulation at that point. For fine geometric structures, or situations such as plasmonic structures, where you know the light confinement will be high, the mesh can be controlled locally using mesh override regions. In the two figures on the lower right-hand side, you can see some results of convergence testing for a 3D CMOS image sensor application. The first figure shows the fraction of source light that is incident on the silicon surface and the fraction incident under the green pixel as a function of mesh accuracy. You can see that good results can be obtained with a mesh accuracy setting of 1, that by 2 you have almost achieved a converged result, and that there is no point in going beyond a setting of 4. In the second figure, you can see the cost in time and memory of the higher mesh accuracy setting normalized to a mesh accuracy setting of 1. You can see that it takes almost 600 times longer to run with a mesh accuracy setting of 8 compared to 1. In this application, where a mesh accuracy setting of 1 can run on a single workstation in a minute or less, this can be the difference between waiting 1 minute and waiting 10 hours for your simulation to complete. Yet the results are almost identical. Clearly you want to be working where each simulation takes only 1 minute, which makes it easy to perform complex parameter sweeps and optimization.